Okay, can I just ask everybody to sort of come in and take their seats? So I want to jump right in because our time with the Deputy Secretary Knives is limited and uh, he really needs no introduction. You have his bio data here um, on, your, on your chairs. Uh, we're really delighted that he could take time out of his busy schedule to come over and talk with, with all of us here in this kind of informal way that we, we do it. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn it right over to you to make some introductory kind of remarks and then hopefully have at least a little time for Q's and A's and then I understand that uh, uh, Barbara will be able to continue on afterwards. Uh, Barbara's our Deputy Assistant Secretary for State Programs, Operation and Budget and I know she's an expert guru on it too. But Deputy Secretary, thank you for coming and you know, it was a big you have one of the most, I guess, difficult portfolios to deal with right now. Uh, but I want to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about budget. Where well, we are and where we're going. Well, thank you very much. And listen, I, I appreciate all of you uh, coming. And I, um, uh, I'm still, I'm still young enough in this job um, uh, to be kind of in awe. Okay. And I, and I'm a big cynic, so you should assure you that I'm not. Uh, I don't go. I don't get to awe very often. Uh, having had a fairly diverse background, having worked at Capitol Hill, and then spent the last decade working on Wall Street. I guess I can't admit that anymore, but I did work uh, 10 years on Wall Street. Um, I, um, uh, having, having been in government, having been back in government for you know a bunch of years, coming to the State Department uh, was a real awakening to me. Um, not because of what uh, people would do all day, but the quality of people that I I began to interact with, and I don't. I'm not just saying it because I happen to be in a room of you know current former you know foreign service uh, officers, but um, I, sometimes I don't think people recognize the immense um, quality and the kind of diversity of the of the people that I've had an opportunity to, to interact with. And what's interesting is is that um, you know in government sometimes people say, oh, it's you know no one wants it. it's. It, it, no one's innovative, and they're stuck in their ways, and uh, they don't want to take risks, and um, you know, you keep getting done. It's it's just not true as it relates to the State Department. It's certainly not true as it relates to the Foreign Service officers. I mean, obviously, I adore all the employees that work in the State Department: the civil service officer, the civil service, and the, uh, and the locally engaged. But you know, as it relates to the conversation we're going to have, I'm talking a little bit about the Foreign Service officers because. In my view, is it's a um, the the because of the way it's organized. And I really, quite frankly, didn't really know this when I came in. But the, but the, you know, it's kind of an upper all culture in some respects. I mean, you're moving all the time. You're you're, you're going to different posts. You're moving around the world. And as you as the promotions happen, um, your career enhances. And at some point, you like everything. It's like you reach the ceiling, and that's a good place to be because at the end of the day, um, it's a motivator. And as I travel around the world, I have been astonished about the ability to not only uh, interact with people who have been in six, seven, eight posts, have been the, been the econ officer, have been the DCM, they've been the political officer, they've been the ambassador in multiple, it's, I mean, again, I, as someone who um, now is 51, I no longer um, get uh, too excited about things, uh, but I just have been become the one of the biggest promoter of what you all do, and it makes my job a lot easier because I believe in the mission, and not because I happen to work for a spectacular Secretary of State, but uh, I just become <coughs> realize that the the role that the Foreign Service officers played on our national security uh, is really critical to what we do. So I'm I'm honored to to be part of this team, and I am honored to kind of be the advocate. As you know. Um, I don't know. When I took this job last January, I was uh, safely ensconced, as I mentioned, uh, at a, my, my former investment a bank that I worked at. And when Secretary Clinton asked me to do this, um, I said, well, Sec Madam Secretary, what, what's my job? What am I going to do? She said, well, I've got a few things I, are on the, on the plate, and so let me, let me just say, here's the things I want you to focus on. I need you to focus on Iraq, because we're doing the largest transition since the Marshall Plan. Uh, I need you to focus on Afghanistan because we have an enormous amount of resources in Afghanistan. Uh, I need you to focus on Pakistan because that's a 
that's an enormous, you know, it's a frontline state and he's with the Kerry Luther Berman money, it's a huge amount of activities. And oh, by the way, um, I also need to kind of work on the, do the budget and just make sure we have the advocacy on the budget. So let me be clear to you, I've never wanted to work on Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan more, uh, now knowing that I have to also work on the budget. So uh, in, an environment where, in an environment where that's been pretty difficult, I, the, the enjoyment factor for me to work on the front line states has been really interesting. I've been to Iraq uh, three times, I've been to Afghanistan twice, I've been to Pakistan twice. I've really not only been exposed to what we're doing on the front line states, but it's also good to be in a, a real uh, understanding of the importance of what you all do all day, but the, the intersection between uh, diplomacy and defense and development, as the Secretary calls the three Ds. And I, you see it up close when you're in Afghanistan and Iraq and in, in Pakistan. But I can talk a little bit about that uh, later in, my, in the conversation that Q's made, because it's really fascinating, because it's not only a huge amount of resources that the Department spent, about 20% of our budget is actually focused on the frontline stage, which is good and bad because obviously it, it takes resources from other things and energies from other parts of the department. It's a pretty important world out there, but nonetheless, it's an important part of what we do. Um, I wanted to, to, to kind of give a reality check of some of the, as it relates to a little couple minutes on this budget issue, because I think it's something we all uh, need to think about a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, I think um, this system and how we do our budgets, um, I know it's going to be shock to all of you. It's a little screwy. I know that's a diplomatic term. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's hard when, I, was, I say to Barbara Russell, who's, who works with me uh, quite closely on a lot of the budget items, but only, only in America would, you, we, would, we, would we figure out how we're spending our FY11 money now, okay, FY11 money. We were debating 2012. And we're trying to explain the justification of our FY13 budget and beginning to plan our 14. So I mean, it's it just it, it, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it, it is unfortunately the reality in which we live, right? So we end up having this scenario where you're you know you're debating one year, you're starting to plan it on another, you haven't spent money the end, and then all of a sudden you get these huge pipelines. It becomes a very complicated and mind-numbing experience, and it's. It, People like you all who have been, are in the Foreign Service or have been in the Foreign Service and say, God, can't they get their act together at the State Department? Why can't we figure out what we're doing? The reality of this is much of this is out of our control because much of the decisions that are made are made by the Hill. And because of the way the appropriations processes work, it is what it is. But it is, it is something we all have to get used to, something I've had to get used to. Poor Rob Goldberg or Barbara who come into my office and say, "Oh, Tom, we got to start the plan in 2014." I'm like, "Are you kidding me? I had just I just presented the 13 budget and I'm not even spent the 12 money yet. So, no, I'm not talking about. It. Of course, I capitulate and I go ahead and do it. But there's there are um, I wanted to mention there, there there's four kind of truths. I, I don't mean this in kind of in a, in a um, a lecturing sort of way, but I there's four things that I've kind of learned since I've done this now for almost a year and a half about the budget process. The, the first thing is, is that you know this better than anyone. We do not have a large constituency for the State Department and the USAID. It just doesn't exist um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and I can go into a lot of details why it doesn't exist, but the reality is it's hard to go and stand up, uh, a member of Congress to stand up in Dubuque, Iowa and, and defend uh, the State Department, USAID's budget. There are some members of Congress who do it, uh, but there, the problem is if you ask the question, and I've now I think I've pounded this into people's heads, uh, but when you ask the average American how much money we spend in the State Department, USAID, Gallup surveyed this, and said, ah, I don't know, 22%, 24%, as, as you all know, um, I only wish it was that high, as you all know, it's less than 1% of the federal budget for everything we do. So that is, you know, for every uh, employee, every building, every piece of assistance, assistance to Israel, Afghanistan, Pakistan, is less than 1% of the budget. I will, from a, using a banking term, that's a pretty good ROI, as I say, return on investment. But even with all of that, we still don't have um, a, a, great, a great constituency. I do blame ourselves for that a little bit, to be honest with you. This is not, I mean, I don't think we have done as good a job uh, as we should have and over the years about communicating what we do for national security, what we do for the world. Um, we nowhere near what the Defense Department has done over the years and built a long, huge constituency as relates to defense spending. Um, I think it's probably because we just think our work will show for itself and, 
they'll see all the good things we do and we'll get credit for it now. Or maybe we still like pat ourselves on the back very much as an institution. Uh, but I think we're getting better at it. But the most important truth is, is that we do not have a large constituency. But that said, uh, for the constituency we have, they're vocal. And that's my second truth. We do, however, contrary to conventionalism, we do have a lot of friends on Capitol Hill. Um, I'd like to say we're not necessarily going to change public opinion that 80% of public is going to say spend more money on foreign assistance, okay? That is not going to happen. Uh, not when people uh, are hurting uh, for jobs and their houses are underwater and their 401 k is worth substantially less than it was. I mean, that's just not a natural thing. And I've been involved in politics enough to understand that all of you have. Um, you know, that's what people care about. And, uh, and understandably, but we do have friends on the Hill, both on both sides of the aisle. I mean, really thoughtful people. Um, you know, like center, like centers like Lindsey Graham and, and Pat Leahy uh, and Dick Luger and, and people like uh, uh, Kay Granger and Nita Lowy and, and John Kerry. And you have really, really intelligent, focused members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who, quite frankly, have been unbelievably helpful to us over time. And it was very helpful to us during this major budget crisis or, or, or or um, uh, uh, negotiation we just went through in 2012. My third truth is, is that, and again, this is going to sound a little self-serving, but I'll do it anyways. Um, um, fortunately, we have uh, Hillary Clinton, and I and I mean that only. I mean, obviously, I work for her, and I and I have a lot of respect for her. But make no mistake, her credibility on Capitol on both sides now has a huge amount to do with how we've been treated recently. Our our budget. Um, I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. I don't care if you're conservative or liberal. People finally believe that she's done a very good job. And the reality is she has. She's, there's no better advocate, in my humble view, for the men and women of this department. I mean, she fights for it every day. She believes in it in her core. And she works the phones, OK? So it's good to have good speeches and do little stuff. But she'll get on the phone. She'll go up the hill. She'll do the work she needs to do to make it happen. So that's the third truth. And the fourth truth. Um, is really what I said at the beginning. We, we don't do a good enough job patting ourselves on the back and advocating. And that's something that I know your organization spends a lot of time on. It's things that we start, we think about a lot, and we need to do a better job in, in the future. So that's kind of the fortune. So let me just spend just a couple minutes on the, on the numbers. So just, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of numbers, but I just want to make sure you understand the scheme of things. So 2012, as you know, was kind of a hellacious year. Um, the, the State Department, USAID, um, were caught in this, this vortex of the, the whole budget debate and all that that was going on. And I was quite worried about us getting really hammered in 12. Um, we, we actually um, we came out OK. I mean, we got cut, obviously, from what the president asked for in 12. But we got about $50 billion in 2012. Um, the, you know, again, about 20% as the frontline states. But it's, you know, that was about 6% below what the president requested, but again, I'd like to say it could have been a hell of a lot worse. Uh, the House, I should tell you, in the first round was probably around um, $43 billion. Okay? And through a variety of work with the Senate, and quite frankly, then the House working with the Senate to their credit, so they came up with about a $50 a billion dollar number. Um, you're going to hear a lot about this, and it, not that you need to spend a lot of time thinking about it, but as you know, for the first time, we have a national security budget, which is, in, which is really interesting. And one of the things that meant was to keep everything talking about national security, which has been our theme for a long time. You can't just talk about the State Department, USAID, as a um, uh, development budget or a diplomacy budget. It's got to be about national security in an environment where money is tight. Some people don't like that because they see, oh, well, we can't really talk about national security. No, we have to, and we have no choice if we, if we want to sustain the gains in which we have, which we have achieved. And a portion of that budget of the $50 billion, about $11 billion of the frontline states. So Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and 12 is really uh, in the frontline states. So in, in just not to, to, again, bore you with a lot of numbers, because that's not necessarily what my objective was, but we're spending about, in 12, about $5 billion in Iraq. We're spending about $3.5 billion in Afghanistan, and about $2.3 billion in Pakistan, just to give you an idea of the, the scope of the numbers. And then we have, obviously, um, the initiatives. As you know, the Secretary's been very, very focused on the initiatives. And uh, global health, which is one of the three big initiatives we did, is a big part of our budget. That is the PEPFAR program, which I give uh, President Bush an enormous amount of credit 
for establishing and putting it on the map, and I give this administration a lot of credit for sustaining that and continuing to grow. But that's about, you know, about $8 billion. We have a Feed the Future initiative, which is really important for those of you who spend a lot of time in this area. Uh, that's about a billion dollars. Then we obviously have our client, Climate Change Initiative, which is about a half a billion dollars, which obviously many of you know how important that is. So we, uh, you know, so for 12, I felt okay about it. I mean, it's not, you know, obviously we had to make some cuts and decisions. One of the decisions we made, and which is something close to your heart, is about, it's about the hiring of foreign service officers and civil service officers. As you know, the secretary uh, uh, made a pledge to increase foreign service officer by about 25% in her tenure. We're sitting there around 20 to 21%, which is not bad, I should tell you. Um, you know, will we be able to get to 25% at the end of this calendar year? The answer is probably no. My goal, to be honest with you, was to sustain a 20% increase, right? And so not to decrease that. And remember, that means, you know, people, as they leave and they retire, we've got to replace them, and we have money in the budget to do that. So that's kind of the... The goal that we laid out is something that we will sustain. So then we go into 13. Um, 13 is actually, that's just the budget we presented. The president presented a budget, as you know, about a month ago. It was about 1% above what it was in 12. Not bad. I mean, it's probably, probably the only budget that actually went up a little bit. About 1% rate of inflation. But again, I'm, you know, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a pretty uh, um, practical guy. Uh, I think um, you know a, a one percent uh, increase for our at least going in uh, is an important part. So that's a that's again something that we will be working on. It's about fifty one billion dollars, and I will be needing your help to really be the advocates of the thirteen budget. And I should tell you, my assumption is the chance of getting a budget through the Congress this year with the camp, with election is probably not great. Uh, but nonetheless, we will still be talking about what we need to do. So, um, so the so the budget to me is. Um, is manageable, but we need to prioritize and continue to focus on the things that are important to us and quite frankly make sure what's important to, um, to uh, the secretary. And there, another, I just want to spend just another minute just to make sure you all understand what we're doing uh, in the frontline states, and particularly um, in Iraq, because this is really where uh, this department has really <coughs> stood up and really shined as it relates to um, something that we've never done before to this level. Um, and I've been quite worried about it, to be honest with you. And I, I've been really impressed by the, by not only Jim Jeffrey and the team out at, at Baghdad, but Pat Kennedy and the team here. But as you know, we're doing the largest transition since the Marshall Plan. Um, you know, if I would have told you a year ago that we'd be in a situation where we would have no military in Iraq come December 25th, 2011, most of you would have said, oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, I know you signed an agreement, but that wasn't going to happen. We have no military uh, in Iraq beyond some advisors who are doing the work on the, on the FMF cases. So the reality is the State Department has basically stood up a, the largest embassy in the world. We're in charge. And, and, and I can't explain to you how complicated that is. And the credit of, of Jim and his team, uh, we're doing it. And we're playing a major role in a very important part of the world. And I am proud to say, having just been back, the, the efforts on our foreign service officers are, and civil service and locally engaged folks is beyond heroic. I mean, it's still a little dangerous, uh, but to be able to do what we're doing. And then, at the same time, we are talking about how we normalize the embassy. So you build up an embassy of this kind, and you're going to decrease it over time, which is an important thing to do. You read a lot about Afghanistan, and again, the President has announced a transition in Afghanistan in which we're sticking to that timetable which is, as they say, a process which will get to um, uh, a turning over security to the Afghans to the Afghan people by 2014. And that will be an ongoing discussion as we uh, begin to draw down our troop levels. And in Pakistan, for those of you who served there, you know, uh, over long periods of time, it's a complicated relationship, but it's an important relationship. It's an important bilateral relationship. We're going to have a very strong bilateral relationship with Pakistan. We have our fits and we have our starts. We have our complications. But at the end of the day, we want to have a very, very strong bond relationship with the Pakistanis. And that's very important to any reconciliation we have in Afghanistan. You must have that relationship uh, with Pakistan. And then finally, one of the things that the Secretary has asked me to spend time on uh, is this thing called economic statecraft. I think you've been reading about it and hearing about it. It's nothing new to those of you around the, uh, around the room. You've been doing it for, for you, know, uh, you know, years as a relation to promoting 
American jobs here, but one of the things that the secretaries really focus on is with the unbelievable need of, of job growth in the United States, we, the State Department is uniquely positioned to drive uh, the jobs diplomacy uh, in these countries. We are the place to come to. We have a thousand econ officers around the world. And I love my friends at the Commerce Department, but they don't have anywhere near uh, the numbers of people, more importantly, the cachet inside the countries as we do. So we have had an enormous amount of focus on job diplomacy. I like to joke about it. You know, we have a, two missions, peace and prosperity. This is the prosperity part of the agenda. And it really is true. And it serves us to really focus on that. So we're kind of retooling what the econ officers spend time on. You know, we talked about ambassadors as the CEOs of their missions. We're talking about that they should be waking up and thinking about how they promote U.S. jobs every day. We set up all sorts of things. In fact, uh, last week, we had the first uh, ever global business conference in the State Department. And we've always had business conferences. But this conference, I invited, or we invited, um, uh, a representative from every uh, country we had a post. So 150 uh, countries came. And most of them were the, were the chairmen of their the local AM champs. That, and they were so dual had it. So the, so the president of Boeing of Japan is also head of the Boeing AmCham team. And so we had 150 countries represented. And so I had the whole cabinet came, the vice president came. It was really a terrific way to talk about jobs, diplomacy, and the importance of intersection between jobs and economics, or, or diplomacy and economics. First of all, it's a good story to tell the Hill. So it's not like we're blind to the fact that this is an economic issue, it's also a diplomacy issue, but it's the right thing to do. And it's quite frankly, we're really good at it. That's an important part of it. So why don't I uh, pause um, and, and just to say again, I, I, I'm honored, uh, beyond honored, uh, to, to, to work in this institution. Um, I don't need to tell all of you, because you've been there and done it, and a lot of you still do it. And um, for those of us who've never done it, um, sometimes I don't think we ever step back and reflect how cool this place is. Uh, so from my perspective, um, it's a great honor. So why don't I? Uh, take whatever questions I can answer, and I won't answer a part one answer. So, why don't we go ahead? Thank you very much, and let's go to the questions. We've got one back here, and then we'll come over. Yeah, thank you, Secretary. Uh, I'm Charlie Clark with Government Executive Magazine. Uh, just a question. Uh, I know you don't want to maybe sing a lot of names, but uh, I recall Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma being particularly tough on State Department witnesses uh, on the Hill, uh, sort of accusing them of not living in the real world in terms of the need to offer cuts rather than uh, budget hikes. And I was just wondering if uh, if you have any response to the idea that the, the staffers and the uh, professional diplomats uh, are not totally uh, adjusted to the uh, budget climate. Yeah, I, I, I you know, listen, I talk, I'm going to talk, discuss individual centers, uh, their good days or their bad ones. Um, but I will say this, um, we get it. And it's not a diplomat anywhere in the world who doesn't understand we're going through very substantial economic hard times here in the U.S. And to be clear, many diplomats are going through economic hard times. There's plenty of, plenty of us in this room who have family members who are looking for a job or are what they call underemployed. You know, plenty of us have 401ks that are, you know, worth, you know, half of what we thought. And I guarantee many of us in this room and many of people have houses that they kept here or are worth nowhere near. Uh, the mortgage they have on them, okay? So we, we don't live in some sort of fantasy world. And, and so, I, so we get it, uh, and we get it in spades. Um, and, and I think, quite frankly, I, I would argue, and I would argue very clearly, that we have the best return on investment than any agency in this government does. So $50 billion for 1% of the federal budget, we not only provide um, embassies and consulates all over the world, you know, 250 different locations where we have people on the ground. It pays for all of our assistance that we do all over the world, including $3 billion uh, for the State of Israel, as well as our support for the Egyptians. It's supporting all of what we're doing in the Arab Spring. It is the, it is the money that we spent on fighting the frontline states, which we have concluded are enormously important to our national security. It's what we do to basically support PEPFAR, which is a Republican initiation of a, of a, a terrific program to eradicate uh, the AIDS virus around the world. 
I mean, tell me where um, money is better spent. Listen, can we always do more with less? Sure, we don't have a choice. We've been cutting. I, we cut all the time. We make decisions all the time. We slow hiring when we can't afford it. We, we, um, we cut back on missions where we don't believe it is. I mean, Pat Kennedy constantly is trimming left to right. Poor Barbara's every day trying to figure out where we were. You know, I was in Seoul. Um, last week, and the, and the you know the the embassy's in terrible shape, terrible shape. I mean, it's just not. We need to we need to we need to renovate the embassy, but we have decided because of priorities, it's in the queue, but it's down the queue line with with things that are also need to get done um, before that for other national security reasons. So we we're living in a very uh, realistic world, and and I will uh, defend to to my last breath the fact of. Uh, our ability to understand uh, that we're living in tough economic times. And with that, I will defend any time uh, at any place uh, the return on our investment. And I think uh, most um, um, most members understand that um, uh, quite well. Thank you so much. You think I was passionate? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Tommy Grant. And Susan is our senior advisor for the Civil Service Association, which just formed. You may have seen the department notice back in January. I like your style. You say, what can we do? I want you to tell us what we can do. We can write about the conditions on Facebook. We could make uh, some statements uh, in other media. But what do you want us, your civil servants, and when I say civil servants, as as Susan always says, civil servants mean foreign service and civil service. What do you want us to do? Give us maybe two things that we won't get in trouble because we love our jobs and want to stay here. <laughs> what can we do to support you and the secretary? Because national security is it. I worked at the passport office for, I guess, 30 years. And we're not talking about a party document. We're talking about border security. Yeah. Finally, I think Congress gets it. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Well, that's that's really nice. I appreciate it. And let's first first what you're already doing, which is you know working here. Uh, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean the fact of the matter is, you know, many of you have committed your careers to working in government service or working for the foreign service, civil service. And the fact of the matter is, by doing that on a low order, that's a benefit to us. I think, as you know, um, you know, the, the rule. I don't know what the rules are. It needs to be um, communicating to the Hill as this uh, group of people, but um, the reality of this is, is that um, we have to tell our stories. Okay? We have to make our stories real. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, with, with George, listen, I'm a big Democrat, so I don't, I don't, so I can say this. What George Bush did uh, on uh, on PEPFAR was beyond remarkable. Okay, so what he did is he basically articulated the fact that 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 fighting. Uh, AIDS and the, and the virus overseas had huge national security impact for us. And he was able to make it real for a lot of Republicans and, and, and church groups and NGOs and I mean, people who never ever supported anything that we talked about assistance. And they rallied around because the president and then Condi Rice and then obviously Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama but made it real. Okay? It is the one part of the budget that doesn't get cut. Okay. I mean, it's really been, they built the constituency, but they made it real. Um, the issues around um, uh, counselor, counselor services, it's unbelievable. That is, you talk to members of Congress, that's, you know, I was in Florida two weeks ago, and I was in Ross Layton's district, you know, she's the chairwoman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, she sometimes gives us a little bit of a hard time, um, but she loves our counselor affairs operations in, in Miami. Okay. I went to visit the operations it's right in her district that she's visited. Numerous times, because guess what? It's not only about national security, it's about constituency service. We're making it real for her about how important this is, okay? And we've got an enormous amount of support on that. You know, we talk about everything. The, the Arab Spring, we, it's a kind of like, you talk about the Arab Spring. When in fact, look what's happened in the last year. Look what's happened last year. You know, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, I mean, look what's going on in Syria. I think the reality is people recognize that the State Department is in the middle of the biggest transition in the Middle East has seen in a hundred years. So I think that the trick for us for our constituency, and listen, 
I, I understand we're never going to change the American public's view of what the State Department is. I don't. That's. I mean, I'd like. To, I want them to feel good about it and they believe that we do the right thing. But this is a this is amorphous to most people in their daily lives. Okay, most people's association with the State Department does not associate with the passport office. I assure you. Okay, but that's the connection for 99 percent of the American people's connection with the State Department is the fact that they have to go get their passport renewal, okay? But for that 1%, and that 1% are really important. There are opinion makers, there are constituents, there are the constituents on Capitol Hill. They need to hear, again, how real this is for all of us. So my, I guess my answer to your very simple question is, it is up to us to make sure that we talk about this in very real, um, real terms. And we have a question here. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, thank you for your time, Mr. Deputy Secretary. I'm Keith Curtis with the Foreign Commercial Service, and I, I really listened very intently when you <laughs> talked about the economic statecraft. Uh, I know as a businessman, you appreciate how important that jobs argument is on the Hill, um, and uh, I also appreciate how you, you love your colleagues in the Department of Commerce, and we appreciate the love. We're not always feeling that much love. My question really is about this economic statecraft is a wonderful initiative, very positive getting the jobs. Um, that the Foreign Service does is very important. It has created some confusion out there in the roles between Commerce and State Department, uh, you know, at the post level. And I'm wondering if you have you're, you're aware of that, and if you're uh, if there's a plan to try and clarify some of that confusion, maybe increase the communication level here in Washington or out in the field about that. That's a great question. Um, uh, I'm first of all, I, I as you know, um, Gary Locke, who was the Commerce Secretary, is now our ambassador to China. Um, and, and, uh, and I've had lots of conversations with him about this, but I've also had lots of conversations with John Bryce. In fact, uh, I had John come over, the Secretary of Commerce come over to the State Department yesterday, and I pulled the 20 of our largest uh, ambassador, our embassies with our ambassadors, into a room with John to talk about the connection between the Commerce Department and the State Department. Select USA, which is a, which is a program to talk about uh, yeah, inward investment, investment from overseas in the United States, which is which is a program that the Commerce Department has done uh, quite well, and how the department, how the State Department can work with Select USA. Obviously, the President's Export Initiative, which is doubling exports in five years, how the State Department can work with the Commerce Department to 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 basically help meet those goals. So, what I have tried to tell our guys, and listen, and you always have, as we like to call it, a channel conflict, right? I mean, uh, and you know, I I try to tell these guys. We don't have time for a lot of, you know, uh, uh, arguments about who's on first. Let's be clear. The reality of this is, is that Commerce plays a very important role in these embassies. Now, the problem the Commerce Department is having, the same time we're having, but to a lesser extent, is that they're having their resource constraints. So they're, on the commercial service, they're pulling people from many of these countries. So we're trying to keep them. We are contingent enough. I am trying to force, whatever that means, you through Chief Emission Authority, keep the commerce, keep the people in these countries. So in places where you have a strong economic team, we want to, to show the value of the commercial service people. You know, sometimes they say, oh, forget them, you know, who cares? They, they want them. They want the foreign court. In fact, they want to double down. So, you know, my view of this is, I have a very, very strong work relationship with the Commerce Department. Most of our ambassadors do as well. Uh, we have to be clear who's on first and who's responsible for things. Our biggest challenge with our econ officers, to be honest with you, they're doing like I, what I like to refer to in the business world as non-core activities. So they're not doing what I'd like them to do, which is econ work. You know, they're the you know control officers when people like me come to the country, which is not really what I've had them doing with their career opportunities. So, so um, I would totally focus on exactly that question because I want to make sure that we're working together collectively. Because you know, one plus one will equal two. It better not equal one and a half, or we've really screwed this thing up. I think we have time for just one more question because of Secretary's schedule. But now it takes two more. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, then you and then we'll go. Uh, Irving Rosenthal, former Minister Counselor of Foreign Service, now a professor at American University. I don't want to rattle the cage too much. Go ahead. But I will. Um, there has been a uh, battle, conflict, if you will, between the defer development and the defer diplomacy ever since year one, let's say beginning with the, the Marshall Plan. It's gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and it's never really uh, been, been settled. 
Well, principle one of management is he who controls the budget, controls the program. And therefore, from your point of view, uh, I'd like to find out what you feel about the relationship between D and uh, the two Ds, particularly since you are now head of, of the budget. And uh, there are three things that you talked about that I, that I will raise, you know, so, some examples. Uh, as far as development people are concerned, and I'm a development per person, PEPFAR is an absolute development disaster. Uh, PEPFAR is a screwed up program that uh, destroys development in any country because it's, it's absolutely single sector focused and you never get into broader develop, uh, health development and you never get into broader economic development. And then we talked about um, this economic state crap. Well, you know, uh, who would you rather have? I mean, in the Marshall Plan, one of the things that it did was develop Europe so that it could grow and trade with the United States and buy and sell. Well, overseas we have AID development officers whose main goal is to develop the local economy, create local jobs, so they can deal with and create jobs in the United States. And you even said that the econ officers are now doing something non-core. That's right, that's not their job. The State Department is a professional organization doing its professional thing and to the extent it tries to become a development agency, is ruining development and it's ruining diplomacy. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> okay, well, that was argumentative. Um, uh, so let me answer the question. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, I have a unbelievably strong work relationship with USAID. Um, I love Raj. Um, I think he's doing a terrific job through uh, USA Forward, uh, trying to continue to reinvent the development uh, uh, development at aid it's hard it's complicated um, you know doing development as for the for those of you who've done it is, is not easy and certainly well appreciated not always well appreciated but certainly respected and as I look hand in hand at what they're doing um, uh, as it relates to the development piece in Afghanistan if you had if Ryan Crocker was here or General Allen was here they said the the, the key part of the clear whole uh, philosophy in Afghanistan is the defense and the development side of the ledger. So I, I, I kind of, I get it and I understand it and I appreciate it. And there is, in my view, a complete link between the development side and the diplomacy side because you cannot, in my view, have one uh, without the other. As a, as a response to your, I, I fundamentally disagree with your, your characterization of PEPFAR. Um, I think, um, again, I just got back from Africa. Uh, I was in the countries in where the PEPFAR dollars principally are the major development dollars that we're spending uh, in these African countries. We are, we are treating uh, 4 million uh, 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 men, women, kids uh, in these countries. We're now upping that to 6 million. If you go to these countries and ask them about how PEPFAR is perceived and how the clinics are perceived, and how we're using the platform of PEPFAR to do other things. That's the whole idea on GHI. The whole idea of Global Health Initiative was to use the platform of PEPFAR to do malaria, which Raj will, is heavily involved in as the initiative over at USAID, uh, and other kind of early childhood uh, diseases as you use that platform that's been created by PEPFAR. So I, you know, we, you know, we can agree to disagree. Um, I will tell you that the um, uh, the public, uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, certainly the people that I deal with at with the USAID, uh, the people that I deal with at PEPFAR have a, a it is in my view one of uh, the most successful programs that we have initiated uh, and the Republican administration initiated and the Democratic administration continued. So I, you know, like anything else, uh, people have uh, complaints and disagreements, uh, but on this particular case I, I am fundamentally a supporter of the PEPFAR program as not only um, a program that helps uh, uh, do something that has ravaged uh, much of Africa, but more importantly is a, a very, very strong uh, development tool as well and will continue to be one. Um, Last question. question here. Um, a lot of us have been out in the past to argue for the State Department budget. And some of us will be out again this spring, early summer, making the same points in the heartland. 
And so I have a, a comment, a question. The comment is it would be very useful if we could look to the website at state or at AFSH or someplace as the budget process goes along so that people who want to advocate for state can be kept current on where things stand, including the good stories that link back to the key priorities that are in the national security budget. And the national security label is critically important when you're trying to make a case outside of Washington. The question is, what was the initial reaction on that? What is state hearing through agents and other offices to the FY13 budget? Is this going to be, are there areas where we need to focus on and we're doing advocacy outside because there's an initially poor reaction, or have you, have you been able to define where they're coming um, Yeah, it's really too early to be honest. I, mean, I, I think it is. We, we spent so much time trying to, remember, we didn't get the 12 budget done until the, all the end of December. So, we, you know, we're all flailing around trying to make sure we got the 12 process done. Everyone was all locked up in this whole uh, budget deficit cuts that were trying to the whole master plan. And so I think we're, we're going to have a real crisis, potentially, not just us, but DOD as well, which is, you know, remember, the, this whole issue around the sequester at the end of the year. So if we don't come up with some budget agreement at the end of the year, you know, we're going to have some major draconian cuts that are going to be automatic. So how that all plays out, depending upon who wins the election, how that all plays out in the election year as it relates to the Bush tax cuts and if they are allowed to expire. All of those things where we'll come into the mix of how those decisions are made. So my, my assumption is that with the, the, the fights that we'll have over the 2013 budget will be really about how much do we spend on the frontline states. Do we really need to spend any more development dollars in Afghanistan? Iraq's coming down. 2013's budget was 10% less than 12. It's going to come down even more than that. I mean, the number we put in 13 will not will even be less than we originally had because we just we're getting we're not we don't believe we need as big a platform as we had. I believe that the security is is better than it was. So those numbers will be coming down. That said, how do we? Uh, where's going to be the argument? The argument's going to be on frontline states. Uh, that we're going to get a lot of pushback on one thing we put in the 13 budget was about $750 million for a Middle East initiation fund, basically an incentive fund, which was basically uh, our answer to, you know, you got all this stuff going on in the Middle East. You got Tunisia, you got Libya, you got Egypt, and we have no money. We can't, we did that in Europe. We had a whole fund, as you know, uh, in Europe focused on, on European development. We need this on the Middle East. So we set up a bucket of money. We're going to have a hard time defending that because Congress doesn't like just buckets of money. They want allocated numbers. You want it all nice and clean, and that's not what we offered up. We just offered a, a bucket of money, so we don't have to fight to keep that. So um, the arguments are going to kind of play out. I think we'll probably be in a situation, I think, this calendar year, that we'll end up just having a CR. I may be wrong, but the reality of this is you've got an election year, the Congress kind of slows down, you have the conventions, then who knows what's going to happen. But we have all the information you need on our website. We've got a lot of stuff, and if there's anything you need, Susan knows where we are. Um, you know, I've, we've been very clear about getting our messages out. My budget testimony was up. My, my, the press thing that I did during the uh, rollout was up. So I'd love to have you guys as best advocates as I can. So let me uh, just uh, sum up uh, as I started. Uh, it's hard for me to articulate um, uh, how uh, respectful I am for what you've done and what you're doing. Um, Many of you have had choices in your careers and where you want to spend your time. Um, you know, it's not always perfect. Um, it is called a job, I know that. Um, uh, but uh, for, the, for someone who uh, was on the outside looking in and now on the inside looking out, it's pretty cool, as I said at the beginning. And, and it's not only cool from the fact of it's interesting, intellectually interesting, right? Um, but we're having an impact. And the State Department in particular is at the front of all these debates all over the world. Just pick up the newspaper every day. It's not always good news, but if you pick up the newspaper every day and look at what, what's going on, we are at the front and center of everything that's going on in the world. And um, that's you all. So um, thank you all very much. Cool. Thank you. to have you as part of the team as you are to be here. So oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.